Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I wanted to share with you a whole bunch of books that I've read recently. These are my favourite books I've read in the last like two and a half-ish months in October alone. I've read eight books. That is a lot of books. I think for the year I'm currently up to 53 books. I've cleared 50 books. This is the most I've literally ever read in a year in my life. You could, you know, use that to analyze the fact that I'm probably a bit stressed at the moment. It's been a stressful few weeks. The more stressed I get, the more I read. <laughs> Anyway, let's just jump straight into the video and I'm going to be sharing with you my favorite books that I've read over the last two and a bit months. Three-ish months, like two and a half, I'd f it's at a, per a period of time. <laughs> the very first book I wanted to speak about was actually the book I read the most recently and it is called The Woman in the Purple Skirt by Natsuko, what was her last name? Imamura. This is a book I listened to on audiobook as I was working away on the illustration project. Because I've been putting so many hours into that recently and because I've been doing so much drawing for that recently, like I, I haven't been working on copywriting so I've been able to listen to some audiobooks. I have gotten through so many books. But most recently I listened to The Woman in the Purple Skirt which I just sort of thought the cover looked interesting for. Wasn't on my TBR or anything, I just decided this is what I was going to listen to. And I really quite enjoyed it, like I thought it was a really unique and interesting little story. So The Woman in the Purple Skirt is a story about I mean, a woman in a purple skirt. <laughs> It's told from the perspective of the woman in the yellow cardigan. We sort of like kick off with the story, we're in this park, this woman in the yellow cardigan is describing the woman in the yellow skirt. No, I'm getting my colors mixed up. The woman in the yellow cardigan is describing the woman in the purple skirt. If people see her, Twice in a day, it's good luck. If they see her three times, it's bad luck. The children all know who she is. They have this game where they sort of like run up and try to tap her on the shoulder because if they touch the woman in the purple cardigan, it's it, it's just like a shocking thing. The narrator of the story sort of depicts the woman in the purple skirt as this very like, almost in like a, like a worshipy sort of way. Like it's, it's like she's obsessed with her. And slowly throughout the story, the woman in the yellow cardigan who is narrating the story starts to meddle more and more in her life from a and it's this really really interesting narrative style that's kind of stalkerish and honestly it took me way too long to be creeped out. <laughs> I just thought it was an interesting narrative style. I never actually properly considered that maybe her like watching of this woman was inappropriate until it got pretty far into the book. I really enjoyed the story. It was very, very short. I loved the way like the writing was. I felt very like immersed in the story. And by the end, I felt like a lot of suspense. Like I really wanted to know what was going to happen. I did overall like the ending. It had a little bit more of an open-ended ending, but overall, I just thought it was a really good, short, strong little story and a very unique little story as well. So I really enjoyed the book. Moving on to the next book, I'll rearrange my pile of books down here, is The House of the House of Hollow by Crystal Sutherland. This novel has been sitting on my shelf since April. I picked this up because the bookseller at Matilda Bookshop recommended it to me and she said it has some really cool dark, gothic, Angela Carter-esque vibes which honestly was the entire reason I bought it because I was like yes that sounds amazing. From the forward of the- is it called a forward? Forward. Forward. Prologue. <laughs> Book words. Honestly, just even from the prologue of the novel, like I just thought the writing was so strong and I felt like it was a really decadent and imagery heavy writing style. The author had a really wonderful balance between having this quite immersive imagery, lightly flowery writing, while also like having like really good characters and a really good plot. I felt so creeped out by this book in certain little bits. I thought it was a really good like, Halloween-y story. This is a story about three sisters who, when they are children, they're in Edinburgh and they go missing for a whole month and come back with these very strange scars at the bases of their throats. They don't remember anything and then slowly their hair starts to turn white, their eyes start to turn black, their behavior is a little bit different to what it was like before. A few years pass by and our narrator is Iris Hollow who is the younger sister. Everything is pretty much normal and fine and dandy in Iris's life until her elder sister actually goes missing and they start to worry that the creepy dark forces that were at play when they were younger and went missing are back again. It's a YA novel, it's a beautifully written story. I really, 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 really loved it. Book number three on my list is Cersei. Okay, this book, I, oh, I loved it so much. I've spoken about this book a little bit because I mentioned it in my like witchy books to read video. I specifically picked up this book because I wanted to film like a witchy books video. And so I, I read that book because I was like, Cersei is one of the like archetypal witches of 
of like Greek mythology and Western storytelling. Like she was one of the OG witches along with Hecate, and so she's a really like important figure within like the witch archetype, right? So I wanted to read that book and I turned out to absolutely love it, and so I whacked it on that list. Circe is a story about Circe, the figure in Greek mythology who was daughter of Helios, the sun. Circe is a nymph. She isn't treated very well by her family, by the people around her. She sort of has a difficult childhood. Realizes eventually that she has this sort of power that other like titans and gods do not have. She realizes that she has the power for witchcraft. And so Circe sort of accidentally turns another nymph into a monster. She's banished to an island and then the story sort of follows on her life and it's kind of this like epic build Dung's Roman story, like this epic coming of age story that goes over Circe's life. It follows all of these really like interesting figures in Greek mythology who I love. It follows Icarus and Daedalus. If you're not familiar, Icarus is the boy who flew too close to the sun. Daedalus is his father who was also responsible for like crafting the wings so that Icarus could fly, but he also made the labyrinth. Ariadne and the Minotaur pop up. I friggin love Ariadne. Had Atlante or Persephone popped up, I would have lost my damn mind because those two are like my other favorite figures in Greek mythology but anyway I thought the writing style was very strong it was just a really strong narrative voice like it just it felt a bit formal in a way that suited like the Greek myth content but it was also accessible it was easy to read it had a lot of like really beautiful natural imagery I just honestly loved it so much and now I'm really really excited because we picked the song of Achilles for our book club for the month of November so we're gonna be reading that together over on patreon and I'm kind of like tossing up whether I want to just like get the ebook for now and pre-order the like 10th anniversary hardback edition with like the gold foil because A, I loved Circe so I think I'm gonna like Song of Achilles um, and B, I just am such a sucker for a pretty book like this. Like I love a good pretty hardback book. So that's my quandary at the moment whether I should pre-order that because it's just so beautiful. Anyway, we're reading the Song of Achilles together over on Patreon and I'm super duper duper pumped for it and I loved Circe. I just thought it was so beautiful and brilliant. Moving on to the next book. The Familiars by Stacey Halls. I also mentioned this one in my witchy book recommendations video story about a young noblewoman whose name is Fleetwood. That is just, I still can't get over how beautiful that name is. Fleetwood Shuttleworth was the name of the woman who actually lived during this time in Pendle in the big fancy house that they lived in. This story is very much inspired by the real witch trials that happened in Pendle in the early 1600s. And so the story is fictional, but Fleetwood Shuttleworth very much did exist. I think she's in her late teens, she's married and she's trying to conceive a baby. She has had a number of miscarriages already. Her husband, whose name is Richard, is very, very concerned with getting an heir for his estate. They're rich people, is what rich people cared about then. Fleetwood is very, very scared she's going to lose the baby because she's had a lot of miscarriages. And out one day walking, she meets this other young woman whose name is Alice. Alice is from a very, very poor family. They get along pretty well, and Fleetwood ends up asking Alice to be her midwife. However, this is during a time where the witch trials and women being persecuted and being accused accused of witchcraft has just started happening in this area of Northern England. Alice ends up being sort of caught up in these accusations of witchcraft. I really enjoyed this story. I really liked the writing style. I felt like Fleetwood was quite a believable main character. She was very like naive in places, which was like fair enough because she's like 17 or like 18 during the book, I think. I really liked how this book sort of looked at Fleetwood's trauma and like the experiences that she had. I also quite enjoyed that this book felt really reasonably historically accurate, even though it was quite a light and easy read. But it was really interesting to get a look at the witch trials during the early 1600s in England from this particular perspective. And yes, I thought it was a really good one, another good witchy novel to read during the spooky season. The next book I want to talk about is Starting Point. I keep referencing this book in videos. I think I've mentioned it maybe three times in the last three months without ever actually going in depth as to why I ordered it. This is a compilation of Hayao Miyazaki's essays and interviews. It's called Starting Point 1979 to 1996 and so it's literally just everything, well probably not everything, but a lot of the things that he was involved with in terms of his essays, articles, interviews, blah blah blah, between this time period. I got this book because I wanted to use it as research for a video essay that I want to do at some point, so expect a Studio Ghibli themed video essay at some point in which I get around to making it. It turns out video essays are a lot of work. <laughs> 
Anyway, I got this book for research purposes. Kind of went ham on doing the annotations for this book. There are a lot of points that I found to be very, very interesting. I just love Hayao Miyazaki. He seems like a really interesting, nuanced, contradictory person. Like he is a person who like hates war. He's very anti-war because he was a very young child when, you know, World War II was happening. His dad had a factory which helped manufacture parts for like war planes. His dad was not pro-war, but he was like, if I can make a profit from something, then I will make a profit from something. Um, and so Miyazaki is the son of a person who made a profit from World War II. And so he has this whole backstory, which means that he hates war, but he's also really, really interested in war planes and he finds war planes very beautiful. There's like bits where we talk about Hayao Miyazaki's love for nature and, and humanity and like all of this stuff, but he's also very gently nihilistic at like certain points. Love reading essays by him because he's also like very cutting and very to the point. Like it's hilarious because there is, I think, the foreword is by, yeah, John Lasseter. But despite that, there's so many bits where like Hayao Miyazaki just rips apart Disney. He talks about the animation industry, he talks about the unions, he talks about the working standards, and he, there's actually a really big focus in here on overwork and burnout because this was a really, really big problem for animators. And in this book, you also get insight into like the beginnings of Studio Ghibli, like his career, basically how he got to where he is. I had only really planned on reading just this one, but I have now gone ahead and ordered the second book. Mostly I just really want to read about Hayao Miyazaki and Ghibli during the time where they made like Spirited Away and House Moving Castle because there's quite a bit of insight into like Lupin the Third, Heidi and all of those like really like sort of early works of Hayao Miyazaki. There's quite a bit on Naushika in here as well, the manga for Naushika. Naushika. I've just sort of realized that that's like the Japanese pronunciation. <laughs> How do you pronounce this word? Is it is it Norska? Nauska or Norska, the manga for that and also the like making of that film. I just love this. I loved it so so very much. I'm excited to read the next one. Neil Gaiman. I did a whole video dedicated to Neil Gaiman <laughs> this month. Like I, I did my Neil Gaiman readathon, which you guys can read. No, if you guys can watch if you'd like, not read. You cannot read a video. And so there was a whole bunch of Neil Gaiman books that I read in the last few months. I'm gonna skip talking about Graveyard Book, Ocean at the End of the Lane, and Car Caroline because I feel like I've spoken about those books to death on this channel. However, I did read American Gods for the first time. I'm now halfway through I'm now halfway through Smoke and Mirrors as well, which I'm listening to on audiobook, which is a compilation of Neil Gaiman's short stories. And I stand by the fact that I like Neil Gaiman's shorter works better than I like his longer works. This book was a very, very, very long book. It's 170,000 words, and I know I keep laboring on that. I do enjoy reading long books. Overall, I think I prefer a longer story if I'm engaged with it. I enjoy really, really long stories. I think the emotional payoff is so much higher than with a really, really short book. However, shadow in this book. Like honestly, the main character of the story is so hard to identify with because he doesn't have any agency. He doesn't know what he wants. He is a shadow. This is a story about a man named Shadow who gets out of prison. Upon getting out of prison, he finds out his beloved wife, Laura, who he's been waiting all of this time to go home and see, is dead. She dies tragically just as he gets out of prison. And so Shadow, not really knowing what he's going to do with his life, gets on a plane trying to go home, meets a man whose name is Mr. Wednesday who claims to be a god and also the king of America. Mr. Wednesday is the sleaziest character I've ever read. <laughs> I hated him. I hated Mr. Wednesday so very much. Every time he popped up, I was like, there he is. <laughs> I hate you. Like he was just, just smarmy. Like just the smarmiest man. Every time he spoke to a young woman, I was like, stop, <laughs> please. Uh. Anyway, that is excellent characterization from Neil Gaiman because that's exactly what you're supposed to feel when Mr. Wednesday comes in. And so I thought Mr. Wednesday was a really, really good character because he was so dislikable and that made me enjoy the book more. Does that make sense? Like I enjoyed hating him. <laughs> 
This book can kind of be described as like a road trip along America. It's a story that kind of analyzes the idea of America, like the sort of like caricature of America. This story also analyzes the things that we as human beings worship, our deities, and so there's lots of different gods from different cultures in this book. And it also looks at like the new gods and the new things that people worship, like the internet or the media. Um, and so I really, really loved that contrast and juxtaposition between the old gods, the new gods, the things that people worship and how the things that we worship change as time progresses. There are a lot of really cool things in this book. I loved the ending of this book, I thought the payoff was really good, but there were parts of this book I didn't enjoy. So if you pick this up and you're like, why is this so boring? At least I warned you. <laughs> it's boring until like this bit. This bit is good, this bit is, is, is a slog. The next book I want to talk about is Zen and the Art of Simple Living. This was a very short sort of like self-help-ish book. I really do enjoy reading books on psychology, mindfulness, this sort of like area of thinking and how to not be an anxious mess. Um, this is a very very short book that's been on my TBR for quite a while. It sort of just sat there and not really moved until someone on Instagram actually recommended it to me and that kind of just pushed me over the edge of finally reading it. I feel like a good way to describe it is like it's like a short book or it's like a very very long listicle. <laughs> it's basically like how to be more mindful in everyday life according to a Japanese Shinto priest I think. Shunmyo Masuno is a Japanese monk and garden designer. He is chief priest of the Soto Zen Temple Kinkoji Professor. Okay, so he's a monk and a priest. I'm not sure what the difference is. Basically, this book is like his meditations on how to live a simple life. There's a lot of like mindfulness stuff in here. So if you've read books on mindfulness before, there's a lot of ideas that have sort of been explored before, but that didn't mean that I didn't enjoy it. Um, I thought the actual act of listening to this book was very calming and sort of like meditative. I enjoyed listening to the book. It was kind of what I needed on the day that I listen to it because I was feeling a bit frazzled that day. But yeah, simple stuff like when you come home, taking off your shoes and putting them orderly down, focusing on what you're doing, being calm, taking your time, immersing yourself in nature, the sort of like basic like mindfulness stuff that you get told to do. Okay, moving on to the very last book of this list and this is The Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman. I have been waiting to read this book for such a very long time. This book is supposed to be Angela Carter's like magnum opus. It's supposed to be her most, it's uh, her strongest novel. This is the novel that she wrote while she was living in Japan. She wrote a lot of it while she was living in Chiba Prefecture next to the beach. I think my favorite Angela Carter book is probably going to remain The Magic Toy Shop. I also enjoyed Nights of the Circus. I love her short stories. I love The Bloody Chamber. I love Angela Carter to absolute pieces. I just think she's so interesting and so cool and her writing is beautiful. She, I love her so much. This is still one of the best books I read of the last two and a half-ish to three months. This is not my favorite Angela Carter book though. Fair warning, there's a lot of sexual assault in this book which is the type of thing I don't particularly enjoy reading about. This is a story about a man who is named... I never really understood how to pronounce it. It... De des Desire... Des Desiderio. Desiderio. You know when you like read a name that's hard to pronounce and you just sort of like you, you never really comprehend how to pronounce it so your brain just sort of skips over it when you're reading. I did that with Quoth, Quoth, in the name of the wind the whole way through reading it. I'm still not 100% sure how to pronounce that man's name. Anyway, Desideri, Desire, Desiderio, I think is the name of the man. He is a young man who is living in this town. I am not 100% sure what continent the town is on. I think it's in South America, but I don't actually know. He's living in this city that's basically been taken over by Dr. Hoffman, who has created a machine that can basically make people's desires manifest in real life. And so this town, this sorry, sort of city is kind of like under a siege of these desires. And so because some people desire really bad stuff, it's pretty horrific. And so it's, 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 it's like a really horrifying situation that's happened to this town. This is sort of like war that's going on between the people and like the desire machine creations. And so desire, de, 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 I'm so sorry. Desiderio um, is like working for a minister who is like trying to basically like fight Dr. Hoffman and stop these horrible desire machines from producing these like really bad 
desiry thingies. Anyway, Desiderio is on his sort of journey to try and stop Dr. Hoffman. However, he falls in love with the beautiful Albertina who sort of like visits him in his dreams. And the conflict there is that Albertina is the doctor's, not, not Doctor Who the doctor, but Dr. Hoffman is his daughter. Every chapter is like a different little adventure within this world. And so the actual world building here is very, very interesting. Again, it's a surreal novel. It's a step further than magical realism because this isn't happening in our own world. It's kind of like a surreal science fiction. The genre is really, really hard to define for this book, I think. I think it just like really easily falls into like the surrealist category. And so that's where it gets shoved by a lot of people. I really enjoyed the writing of the book. I think her writing style is very unique. I, I just, I love the way she writes her books. I thought this was a very unique and interesting world. I thought it was a strong story overall. It's probably my least favorite Angela Carter book I've ever read, but it is still Still one of the best books I've read of the last two and a half months and so that is why it's on this list. I hope you guys enjoyed watching and I hope that you found some cool interesting books to pop on your TBR. Please let me know what you guys are reading at the moment. I get so many book recommendations from the comment section of my videos so please do let me know what you're reading and also an enormous thank you to everyone over on Patreon for basically being the reason I can make videos. There's a whole bunch of bonus content, bonus videos and stuff that we do over on Patreon including our book clubs so if you'd like to check it out, there's a link in the description down below. Take care, everyone, and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.